Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal author series. And I'm very happy to have Claudio Ricci with us today. Hey, Claudio. Hey, Frank. How are you doing? I am doing super duper on this August 4th of 2021. Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a very typical hot day in Phoenix. We're probably up around 43, 44C today. Um, so it's, it's blasting. Um, and where are you at, Claudio? Uh, I'm currently in Santiago. Uh, here we are supposed to be in winter, but it's been uh, kind of like summer weather, uh -huh. 25 degrees. Uh -huh. Have you been getting a lot of wildfires there? In a, lot of, a lot of which? Wild, wild, wildfires. Wildfires. Uh, yes, there are wildfires uh, in the south, uh, both in Arizona and in California currently. Um, things are just dry and there's a lot of buildup. And so, yeah, we're getting western U.S., southwestern U.S. is getting some, some fires. Yeah. Why are you getting fires in Chile? No, not yet. I guess like this usually comes in the summer. I was going to say. Here is, uh, yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah. Well, I think you have the honor of being the very first person from Chile to do this. I think. Oh, wow. <laughs> nice. Uh, that's great. Of course, that's a hotbed of astronomy. So, you know, it's, it's good stuff. Um, that's great. Uh, what institution are you at and what's your position there? I'm an assistant professor at the Universidad Diego Portales. Uh, but I also have actually an um, affiliation and faculty at uh, the Cal Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics in Beijing. Uh -huh. oh, and uh, I work also at George Mason University. So usually I move a lot around these places, but it's uh, it's been a couple of years that I'm uh, kind of stuck here. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> the traveling minstrel gets grounded. He has to yeah. stay home, <laughs> especially with the you know current uh, pandemic going on. That's awesome, Claudia. What do you uh, what do you like to do for research? So I work on supermassive black holes, and I'm interested uh, in particular in two aspects. Uh, so how the black holes uh, basically are covered by material, and how they interact with this material mm -hmm. uh, on scales of a uh, few parsecs, uh, typically. And also on how they, uh, they accrete, on how they eat material from, uh, from their surroundings. And particularly, this is something that is relevant uh, to the, the paper I will be talking about, how this accretion works and uh, how this accretion can go wrong in some cases, and very weird things can happen. <laughs> it's black holes, weird things happen. Um, that's awesome. And that is going to bring us to this very lovely APJ supplement article, and we have the 450 day x ray monitoring of the changing look AGN 1ES 1927 plus 654. And Claudio, take us away. Okay, um, so this is actually the, ter the third of a series of papers of a large campaign on an object that has been uh, giving us a lot of surprises that is this 1ES 1927. Um, so before starting, maybe I can give some introduction on what we are looking at. Um, so when we talk about AGN, of course, we are talking about supermassive black holes that are creating material from their surrounding. Mm -hmm. And we know that uh, this material uh, is basically funneled down through an accretion disk. And around, uh, around this accretion disk, there are clouds uh, that move around the black hole and uh, they can produce uh, broad uh, optical uh, and UV emission lines. Mm -hmm. um, uh, at larger distances, you have dust and gas that can obscure your creating supermassive black hole. Uh, but typically, the, the way historically also people have been classifying AGN uh, is by uh, looking at whether they show or not uh, uh, broad optical lines. In case they show broad optical lines, this means that you, one can observe the system sort of pull on um, and uh, so that the system is not hidden behind a screen of dust and gas and these uh, broad lines can be observed. Uh, if the system is observed edge-on, instead one cannot really see these uh, broad optical lines just because they are reddened. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is all fine and it's all kind of, uh, we mostly agree on uh, to a certain extent, uh, but there is a class of objects, uh, the so-called changing glucagian, which actually display very particular properties uh, because they, what they do is that they don't show uh, any broad optical line, and then all of a sudden, this broad optical lines appears. Huh. Uh, the, the, the contrary is also true. They show broad optical lines, and then all of a sudden, these broad optical lines disappear. Um, 
so usually we uh, we we have detected these objects by looking uh, repeatedly at uh, some of these supermassive black holes uh, with time differences uh, basically of like a few months or a few years. Uh, but this one, 1AS 1927 is the first object in which these transitions were actually observed uh, spot on. So we were able to actually detect uh, the appearance first of a blue continuum and then of the optical, uh, the broad optical lines. Wow, cool. Um, nice. And uh, yeah, and then that's where the surprises started. And uh, um, so this first paper, which was uh, authored by Benny Trachtenbrot, in 2019, which is also an EPJ paper, reported the discovery of this source and showed that uh, besides detecting the appearance of these broad lines in the optical, we didn't see any broad line in the UV. Mm -hmm. uh, and another thing that uh, became very obvious, and maybe we can go to the figure one already, okay. is that uh, after this peak in, uh, in optical UV emission and the appearance of the lines, uh, what happened is that the source started to decrease its flux in the optical UV, uh, with a slope that is consistent with a t to the minus five over three, which is usually um, associated uh, to tidal disruption events. So the disruption of a star by a supermassive black hole. Okay. But this cannot be a normal tidal disruption event because this is, we know that this was an EGM before. We have been seeing it accreting since the uh, 90s. This was a source that was originally detected by the Einstein X-ray telescope. Yeah. Um, so here you can see actually in the figure uh, this decline in the gray points in the background. Uh -huh. So since the source was so interested, inter interesting, we started the uh, X-ray monitoring campaign. And this plot here shows you the, all the observations we got for these 450 days uh, with a number of facilities. So new star, XM and Newtons with XRT and NICER. And then our campaign actually continued and we have uh, uh, several uh, several um, uh, works in preparation uh, on the new data. Uh, the one thing that you cannot see here, but which was reported in the two previous papers, uh, is that actually the X-ray light curve is extremely uh, surprising. Uh, so the source started at the same level of flux as the historical value. Okay. Um, the event started in, uh, we think, in around the end of December 2017. And then after this, uh, the source first went down in luminosity. So it started at 10 to the 43 arc per second, went down to some like 10 to the 40, and then it went up again within 100 days of four orders of magnitude. Okay. So to 10 to the 44, and then it plateaued there, and then it kept it decreased back to the uh, original level from uh, um, 10 years ago or so. Okay. So the, the most surprising thing here already is that this is uh, possibly the most variable AGN of these time scales because it went up really like four orders of magnitude. That is just something that uh, is sort of unprecedented. Absolutely. And also, it showed a lot of uh, intraday variability. So, looking at the spectroscopy, and we can go um, to figure two, uh, which is what this paper is about. Our first spectrum was okay. So, one of the most interesting things in terms of the X ray campaign on this source. Uh, was that when we uh, started with the first observation, we actually found uh, that the X-ray spectrum looks really different from what it looked like before, uh, so from archival observations, but also to what usual normal AGN looked like. So in order to put this into a little bit into a context, uh, um, I need to explain you uh, how X-ray emission is uh, produced in AGN. Okay. And uh, so X-rays are produced by um, a gas of hot electrons that is located very close to the supermassive black hole. And what these hot electrons do is to transfer some of their energy uh, to the optical UV photons uh, from the accretion disk. And this usually results in X-ray emission with a very clear power law-like uh, form uh, with a slope of something like, like 1.8. And this is what is observed in all AGN. And uh, this usually covers the range uh, from a few tens of kV up to 100 or more kV. Mm -hmm. uh, so this source was really puzzling in terms of X-ray spectroscopy because when we looked at our first X-ray spectrum, we saw that it was dominated by some soft component. Uh, so here, if you look at, uh, if you go a little bit down, uh, towards the energy. So this is like 1 kV. Um, uh, so the scale is down, but yeah, that's exactly, that's a 1 kV mark. Um, so above this, above something like 2 kV, there is actually very little emission 
uh, from this power law component, which was observed before. And this means that something happened to this X-ray corona, uh, destroying this uh, plasma of hot electrons that produces this uh, X-ray emission ubiquitously observed in AGM. Got so it. something really catastrophic happened in, uh, in this object. So mm -hmm. if we go to figure three, we can see this even more clearly. So figure three is the, the spectrum with, uh, with together with the model. Um, and we can start from the first uh, of our spectra. We have hundreds of spectra here. I'm uh, just showing the, some, uh, the three width from XMM, uh, which are very characteristic. So if we look at the first at uh, the top panel, uh, we see that uh, most of the emission comes from uh, uh, this very soft component uh, with the power law emission, which is the, this black hole line, accounting uh, for just a tiny fraction of the overall flux. Uh, and then we have these couple of broad Gaussian emission lines, um, which are also uh, quite strange because they are not the lines that one typically observes uh, in AGM uh, at those energies. And they could be just an artifact due to the fact that there is actually some very strong uh, um, absorbing wind that is uh, uh, modifying the shape of the spectrum. Uh, but we are still very unsure. This is still very much work in progress, what these two lines are. For the time being, let's focus on this power component and its disappearance and the disappearance of the X-ray corona. So if we look at the December 2018 observation, so um, the one in the middle panel, you can see that after a few months, as the source increased its, its X-ray flux, what happened is that the power component restarted, came back, and restarted uh, dominating the hard X-ray emission. And in May 2019, which is the third panel, this is even more obvious. And you can see that uh, this looks again more like, uh, uh, let's say, a normal AGM than uh, uh, this object in the, in the first observations. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, is, this was extremely puzzling, and it really took me a long time uh, to come up with a coherent, mm -hmm. I hope, uh, explanation for, for all yeah. this. Um, so something else that is really interesting is if we go to figure five, is the intraday variability of the source. So I mentioned earlier that on time scales of uh, tens to hundreds of days, there is a lot of variability. But even in a single uh, observation uh, with XMM, for example, uh, yes, this one, we see a lot of variability. Mm -hmm. So if you look at, at the first panel, and that's the, the first uh, XMM observation, you see that the source uh, at the first peak um, after a few few hundreds uh, of few kiloseconds from the beginning of the observation, mm -hmm. and then it had a decline. And in some uh, X-ray bands, this, uh, this difference is of about two orders of magnitude. So it's, uh, it's actually very strong on yeah. these time scales. And this, uh, this tells us that something really dynamic and uh, dramatic is happening in this object. And you can see actually the, the other two light curves are also very, um, uh, very agitated, so you have already a lot of flux going up, uh, up and down. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, very good. Wow, wow, yeah. So, these small numbers here are just different intervals that uh, uh, we use for the spectroscopy. Uh -huh. So, I will show you a little bit later how the spectra of these uh, uh, different intervals look like. Uh, but so, just summarizing what we have seen so far, this is uh, changing look AGM, broad lines appeared. Uh, the X-ray source uh, somehow disappeared right after the appearance of these blue lines, and a lot, lots and lots of variability on basically all time scales. So now let's go to uh, figure nine, and we can start looking at how the different parameters and the different components in the X-ray spectrum change. Okay. Figure nine? Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's this one. Okay, so here we have on the y-axis uh, the extra luminosity of the source, and on the x-axis you have the temperature of the black body, so this thermal component that is very uh, prominent in the first observations. Mm -hmm. And we can concentrate on the top panel, which are the XMM Newton observations, and uh, you have the different intervals that I showed you before. Um, for the three different observations. And the three observations are shown <laughs> with different colors. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see that uh, this black body actually moves towards higher energies. Right. So its temperature increases when the luminosity increases. Mm -hmm. And this is something that you don't see in AGM uh, because uh, the accretion disk uh, in AGM doesn't, uh, the AGM is too massive, the black hole is too massive 
for the accretion disk to emit in the X-ray band, so you, you don't see it. And the X-ray, the soft X-ray emission, which is usually um, interpolated also with a black body, uh, doesn't change uh, with the luminosity. So, but here you can see very clearly that uh, the temperature goes from 70 to 200 electron volts uh, as the luminosity increases. Yep. And what is interesting is that this follows a trend that is not too different from the uh, luminosity proportion to the temperature to the four, uh, which is what you expect to see in accretions. And if you go to the middle panel, we can see the same thing for all the nicer observations. So I want to mention here, nicer was uh, fantastic because uh, it's, uh, um, it's this X-ray monitor uh, that is on the International Space Station. And it has a huge effective area. So with a very short observations, it can get really a lot of photons, particularly for a source that is as soft as this one. So for very short observations, we were getting half a million of photons, which mm. in my experience, at least it's a lot of photons. That's so great. we were able to, to do really a lot of the detailed spectroscopy. Um, so you can see here a similar trend. So as the black body, as the luminosity increases, the black body temperature also goes up. Uh, so this is telling us maybe that uh, uh, this AGM uh, is accreting um, first as a relatively low black hole mass, yeah. but also that is accreting at a very high added pressure, yeah. uh, which, which could explain why you see this increase uh, uh, of the black body temperature with the luminosity. So now let's go to uh, figure 13, um, just to show what changes in terms of the power row component. Uh, so I was mentioning that uh, in the first observations, we saw no power row component, so no uh, X-ray corona. And here we can maybe focus on the right-hand panels, yeah. uh, just out of fairness for, for nicer since before we discussed XMM. Um, so here we are plotting the ratio between, uh, particularly let's look at the last, uh, the last panel maybe, uh, we are looking at the ratio between uh, the emission in the power row Mm -hmm. so from the corona and the mission in the black body, which okay. is probably could be the accretion disk, could be some shocks in the disk or something like this. So what we see here is that as the luminosity increased, as the source went back to a very high luminosity after this very strong uh, decrease in flux, the power row actually was coming back. Um, so our interpretation of this is that uh, something dramatic happened mm -hmm. to the accretion disk so that uh, it uh, uh, destroyed the corona. And as the luminosity increased, the accretion disk reformed and also the corona reformed. Okay. Um, so if we remember um, one what of the things I mentioned at the, yeah, go ahead. What are the, what are the, the green squares here? Uh, this is a good question. Those are the historical observation from XMM. Uh, which was before the outburst. And you can see indeed the, the, their things look like uh, uh, what you see in normal agents, so no variation with luminosity and uh, everything right. was fine. Also the ratio, the power was dominating uh, the overall X-ray flux. Uh -huh. okay. uh, so at the beginning, I was mentioning that uh, uh, whatever triggered this event uh, produced also a decrease in the optical UV flux with a slope that is consistent with the T to the minus five over three that you observe in tidal disruption events. Mm. So one of our explanations for this event is that uh, an AGM interacted with a star. So what happened is that uh, the star passed nearby, some of the material was tidally disrupted and was captured by the gravitational field of the supermassive black hole. It hit the accretion disk. And simulations show that when uh, this tidal debris hit the accretion disk, you have a lot of shocks. Now these shocks uh, are gonna deplete the angular momentum of the gas basically creating a free fall of the material towards the black hole. Okay. And this would uh, effectively increase the accretion rate in the inner parts of this uh, system. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the corona, which is anchored to the magnetic field of the inner parts of the accretion disk, would also disappear because the accretion disk is depleted. Okay. And this will lead uh, uh, quite naturally to the disappearance of the uh, corona and uh, to most of the, the, weird, the weird things we see from this object. And then as the accretion disk replenish the inner regions, we would expect to see the X-ray corona being reformed 
and this will correspond to this increase that we see above 10 to the 42.5. Uh -huh. uh, with the X-ray corona actually starting to dominate mm -hmm. uh, the overall X-ray emission. Right. Uh, so this is basically it in the sense that this is uh, most of the results we, we present in this paper. Uh, we discuss about different uh, possible explanations and also how uh, probably in the future we will be able to detect more of these objects. Okay, very good. So we are still continuing with our work and we have uh, um, several uh, studies in progress. So we are analyzing now uh, the latest part of our X-ray campaign uh, because the source actually after this outburst went back to its normal state. And we are also looking at uh, um, the X-ray variability properties, trying to see whether we can learn more about uh, this, uh, this, um, this event. Very cool, very nice. <clears throat> Claudio, thank you for walking us through your very lovely article, number three in the series. Um, let me ask you, where do we where do we go from here? Uh, so, are there how many how many changing AGN are there? Do we have any other examples of ones that are have this much variability on this kind of time scale? So, are there new observations that are coming? You don't have to spill your next research project. You could if you. <laughs> Um, but yeah. just where, where do we go in the future with, with uh, sort of detangling uh, this mixture of AGNs and TDEs and variability? Yeah, yeah, no, this is, uh, I think it's a field that it's going to get a lot of momentum in the next years. Uh, so first, to answer your question, this is the, the first object in which uh, uh, this sort of uh, spectral transitions were observed in the X-rays. Got it. Um, there, this might have happened in other changing loop AGN and could just be that we didn't see them. Yeah. because uh, nobody was looking with some X-ray telescope. Uh, but uh, I am, it's unclear whether like this, uh, this, uh, this uh, happened in any other object uh, observed before. We know about, uh, I think, like several dozens. Maybe we are reaching the 100 uh, changing look AGM, okay. uh, different redshifts. So there, and there is also a bunch of uh, quasars at uh, high redshift that have shown this uh, variability in the optical emission lines. And uh, in terms of like detecting more of these objects, I think uh, uh, with the advent of LSST, at least in the optical, we will be able to see a lot of this uh, extreme variability AGN. And, uh, and for the X-ray part, uh, um, things like Hirosita, um, which is scanning the, the whole sky repeatedly, might pick up some of this, uh, these extreme uh, transients, uh, particularly seeing things that change their spectral shape from one passage to the other. And also um, a future facility called the Einstein probe. This is uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's a facility led uh, by, um, uh, by the Chinese Academy of Science mm -hmm. and which is supposed to scan the whole sky. So I think a combination of these uh, facilities will detect many more objects, uh, potentially like this, but at least several more changing look AGN. And also SDSS-5, uh, which is observing uh, uh, repeatedly several quasars might catch um, a, a large number of new changing look AGM. And who knows, maybe some of them would be as crazy as one ES 1927. Cool, cool. <clears throat> uh, and I'll just note on a side note, because I see them roll in, um, there's certainly uh, a small flurry of activity on um, theoretical models of stars in AGN disk and the supermassive black hole. So how do stars behave there? How do you get TDEs going off? So um, there's also a number of, of theoretical works that uh, seem to be in vogue here at the moment. So I agree with you. I think this field's going to see um, some very interesting action over, let's say, the next five years or so. So very cool. Very nice. Yeah, looking forward to see what the future will bring us. Yeah, yeah. All right, so Claudio, thank you very much again for walking us through your lovely APJ supplement article. And thank you everyone for watching and I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.